Thank you so much, Maria. Our first conversation this afternoon will focus on a central topic to entrepreneurs, accessing capital. Lack of access to capital continues to be a barrier for women-owned businesses. On average, women start businesses with almost half as much men, money rather as men, $75,000 versus $135,000. And despite this challenge, women-led firms prove that they tend to do more with less. A gender gap in equity financing and a dearth of gender diverse teams at a management level also impacts women entrepreneurs in getting their ideas off to the ground, off the ground. So joining us today are Amanda Brown from the National Women's Business Council. Amanda focuses on economic issues facing women entrepreneurs. Erin Glenn of Choir, an online platform that helps companies raise equity from supporters, creating a community of investors. Deborah Jackson of Plum Alley Investments, a private membership of investors supporting female innovation and gender diverse teams. And Ashley Larson of Revolution, a venture capital firm where she focuses on capital, growth capital. And leading the conversation is the Atlantic's Jillian White. So Jillian, the floor is yours. Well, I'm excited to be here, and thank you guys for all being here as well. This is a really important conversation that I'm really excited to have with all of these experts, um, and it is about money um, and how female entrepreneurs are able to access it or not, where that stems from, and what some of the solutions are. So I do not want to waste any more time with me blabbering. I want to jump right in. Amanda, I told you I was coming to you first. Can not you, <laughs> can you I'm ready, I'm the ready. question for us a little bit? Talk to me about what you see the main problem as and where it comes from. Definitely. So the, the council does research on this issue all the time. We, and I'm speaking to the choir right now just in terms of we all know that capital is the greatest barrier for entrepreneurship. And for women, it just presents a whole, there are a lot of other complications that come, come into play. And she was just citing some of the council research. So on average, it's kind of women are receiving half as much capital in some of the higher growth industries, actually. In the same research study, we found that women are receiving about one sixth the amount of capital as their male counterparts. So imagine raising money and you're getting $210,000 for your business, but some the guy sitting right next to you that has maybe the same idea, I'll say maybe a worse, less better idea, right? <laughs> um, he's raising over a million dollars for that idea. Um, so when you're walking away from that, obviously your opportunities ahead uh, vary. I think one of, you know, and you were asking too, like how big is this problem? Yeah. It's huge because we have 50% of the population, right, is women. We have now just hit this milestone of 10 million women entrepreneurs across the country, 10 million business owners. And I think at this point, I keep saying this too, you can Google how to start a business, um, and you, but you can't Google how to scale that business. And it's the same in terms of the resources, right? And as we're trying to encourage more women to not just start, but make sure that those businesses are successful over time, that, that involves a lot of money. And I will say just the council, we were started back in 1988, actually. Uh, at the time, women still needed a male co-signer to actually get a bank loan. 1988. Right. Um, so we, you know, fast forward 30 years and the fact that we're still seeing so many of the same struggles and um, we have many uh, much better experts on the VC space, but you know the latest numbers show that women are getting 2.7% of venture capital. And when, yeah, what my immediate solution then would be we need more women on the other side of the table, but even that number has been declining. And we're down, I think it's like 8.8% yeah, 8 of uh, women that are in leadership in VC. So uh, the, the problem is really big. It's also a problem that's gonna require a lot of different players, which is why having this conversation is so important. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. And one quick comment though too on one reason that women are receiving less money is they tend to ask for less. Yeah. So it is something really important to keep in mind because we tend to go to the table with a very frugal outlook and thinking what's the bare minimum that I need and instead you really as you're preparing your financial models, you need to think about what I need to get me through to the next round of funding and that series of milestones and build in plenty of cushion and that six month window to get your next round of financing in place. So ask for a lot more than you think you need. And we touched on this a little bit, but I wanna go a little further into it. 
where money for women's ventures comes from versus where money for men's ventures come from. So we know already that women's businesses aren't getting as much VC funding. Where is it that they are getting their money from? Is, are those sources problematic? And how do they play into the discrepancies that we see? And this is open to whoever wants to take it. Yeah. Kudos to the SBA also for, yeah. <laughs> for moving money through their loan process, for sure. So, so it's interesting. Um, when you look at online crowdfunding platforms, women are getting an equal amount of capital in those situations, but it's very different offline. You know, as, as was mentioned before, I think it's interesting in that 94% of decision makers from the venture capital standpoint are male. And we also know that women VCs are twice as likely to invest behind a woman uh, on an investment team and three times as likely to invest in a woman who's a CEO. So there's clearly an imbalance on both sides of the equation. As we mentioned, VCs are coming down. The, the proportion of female VCs is coming down. Um, you know, there's a number of reasons behind that, but I, I think we need to, to do a lot of work there. So I, I also want to just make one comment about this issue of capital. And thank you so much for the SBA and all of you here today for um, having this conversation, because we cannot have this conversation enough. So I come from Wall Street. I'd worked at Goldman and, and had spent 21 years on Wall Street before I became very involved in funding, investing in women entrepreneurs, and then started my company. So. One of the issues here about getting capital to women is we also have to get women off the sidelines as investors. Women in the US alone control $11 trillion of money today that is not invested, essentially. Not managed, not invested. And my partner and, and my company um, did worldwide research about women investors and what was going on with them. And guess what? The number one thing women say they want to do is invest in women entrepreneurs. They just don't know how. They don't feel they have the access or the knowledge. So you know, there's only so many times that we can go knocking on the, the doors of the Silicon Valley firms that are male dominated and say, you know, please fund us. They many times they don't understand the businesses and the products and the female market, so it's just not going to happen. And so we can do all, you know, keep fighting, but I think we have to also have the conversation about women should invest. We we, we if if you own a home, if you have a savings account, if you have a 401k, guess what? You already are an investor. So why not own it? And along with your public company portfolio, also consider investing in early stage companies, because that is where the wealth is being created. If you look at the IPOs, a couple of IPOs with Facebook and Twitter, we made the next generation of the Carnegies and Rockefellers in the last decade, and there is no woman among that. And women are the primary users of those companies. So, I, I, you know, I'm yeah. just, just bringing the other side of the equation. Yeah. You have companies that need money, and you also have women who need to also invest. And Erin, I want you to weigh in on this. Totally. Um, so quick background on me. I also worked on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley. I was a management consultant before that. I've worked in Southeast Asia. Um, was CFO of a video game company startup based in San Francisco. It took them from nine employees to 550 and a whole, whole, whole lot of top line revenue. And I was one of the only women at the executive table there, which was super interesting. And we did some fundraising. But my current company, we've been raising money for venture-backed startups. And we allow anyone to invest. And our mission is the customers and the early adopters of these startups are getting a chance also to be owners. But what we found, and this is super important, is you can get squeezed from two ends. You know, one is the venture capital industry right now, as it's structured. There's this thing called fiduciary responsibility, where they have an obligation to the limited partners who have given them money to invest. So we found it to be very challenging to get money carved out from the overall investing round to just allow customers to invest. But the other end is regulatory. And many of you might be aware of the JOBS Act, which President Obama passed several years ago. And the final piece of that legislation is called Title III. And it's what allows anyone to invest. So you don't have to be making $200,000 a year or have a million in net assets, which, oh, by the way, that's only 3% of American households who qualify for accredited. 
So in the past, to invest in these early stage companies, if you weren't already making a ton of money or had a lot of assets, you were locked out of that. So it'll be really interesting to look at platforms like Plum Alley, Seed Invest, that are moving into Title III and bringing these opportunities to the table. And I think getting off the sidelines is one of the most important things that women can do to support each other. And that can mean, particularly with Title III, you can invest as little as $25 or $100 or $500. So you want to invest an amount of money that you can afford to lose, because while we've had these incredible companies like Facebook or Google, most startups fail in the technology world. So you just you want to invest what you can afford to lose, but you want to get into the game and start mm -hmm. learning and start building your confidence. So do that with a small dollar amount. All right, and Deborah, oh. go for it. I wanted everyone to kind of weigh in on how they see Title III having an impact. So let's do that, and then we can get to your comment. Great. So I, I, my company, Plum Alley, um, has been championing women entrepreneurs for over four years now. And we've done a version of e-commerce to get them more sales. And we have a non-equity crowdfunding uh, functionality that's been around for a couple of years. And six months ago, we moved into actually investing. We have members who look at, we, we showcase companies and we give members the opportunity to invest. Many of those people have never invested in before in private companies. So, so that's what we do. But my, what I've learned from crowdfunding is that, first of all, it's the wrong name. Mm -hmm. There is not the crowd. Right. It is not, it is your network. It is your network. Just think about this. People do not have the behavior of getting up Saturday morning and going online and saying, okay, I'm going to go find something to give $25 to or $100. That, that is not a behavior people have. The behavior that they do have is if we want to fundraise, it's like what we do with schools and you know colleges and political fundraising. We go and we contact all our friends and we twist their arm and say, you got to help me or this is important to me and then people give you money. That's exactly how it happens on non-equity crowdfunding. So that is um, important, but it is not the answer. It is not the answer. There's not like people out there that are just massively going to call and th throw money at you. So that I think it has to be we, we've lived with it and, and we've seen what works and what doesn't work, and I think that's very important. With the new regulations that are about uh, that are coming about, um, it's a little tricky because you know who doesn't want to democratize fundraising and get a lot of people to participate? That makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, you know, investing in early stage companies is tricky, and you're probably going to lose your money. And so sometimes it's, uh, you know, I think a little tricky. And I think, that, you know, when people do lose money, that's going to end that. Nobody's going to be happy about that. So I think the way to go about this is somewhere in between the two. I think it's really important that people have, <laughs> have um, some context. You know, have a portfolio. You would never think about just picking one stock in the public markets and putting all your money behind that and keeping your fingers crossed. You need a portfolio. Lots of things can happen. Same thing on early stage company investing. And, and most people do it because one of their neighbors or a friend is, has a company and they want to help out. And, but that's really not you know, going to produce a good result probably. So the, there are things you can do. A lot of things we know about public companies that you can do. You need a portfolio. You need to do it with other people. And you need to pull your money. Yeah. Did you want to weigh in on that? Or? <clears throat> sure. You know, in, in my opinion, you know, sitting at the table and, and watching a lot of women um, entrepreneurs pitch to me, the things that are holding women back are the same things that are holding them back from answer, asking a question in a classroom or standing up at a PTA meeting. So, you know, women it's, are, are kind of thought or taught to think that uh, it's, it's not polite or ladylike to have the next big idea that, and to plan for world domination. But guess what? All of your male <laughs> counterparts are in that room telling me that they're going to do that. So, you know, I think that women need to start thinking bigger. I think that women already face a challenge in terms of relatability. So a lot of the products and problems that women entrepreneurs are solving are geared towards women or issues that women face. And therefore, it's difficult to speak the same language to the 94% of males who are there making a decision. Um, you know, and I just I think that, uh, that women just need to uh, have more confidence in themselves and, and really speak that language and do what the guys are doing. 
And I did want to come back to you because I yeah. know you had a bunch of thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My mind is racing right here. Um, no, so one, Deborah definitely hit it on the head in terms of the, your social network. So the council actually put out a toolkit for women to think about who is in their network and how to build that network because it is so important. And she's right, people are not clamoring and going, you know, going on the internet to search. And I think in order to run an effective crowdfunding campaign, you've got to know how to organize. And if you're not organizing right, um, you're going to struggle there. And so I also would give kudos to Deborah. You know, one of the things that they do with Plum Alley is help women um, build, build a strong campaign so that they are more successful in that effort. So that's a great resource for people. But then just in terms of the way that people also think about investing, for women, I think we have this history of also kind of giving back. And the money that we've had control over in the household has been the thrill and thought philanthropic dollars, right? And you're not getting money back for those investments. And so why do we have this sort of angst about investing in early early stage businesses when like we're not going to get money? Maybe, right? But um, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to just think about the anxiety that we have on that side versus, you know, when you're giving, writing money a check away. for $5,000, right? And it is going to a very good cause, right? Um, no doubt about that. But you're not getting money back. And so I think we just have to kind of shift the mindset that we have about um, how we're using that money. Yeah. There's definitely a psychological shift that we all have mentally from donation to investment. But one quick stat that I'm going to get wrong, so you can Google it. <laughs> but um, Kickstarter has published some information about the campaigns that get funded. And the majority of the funding comes from Facebook and right. discovery. So it's your friend is supporting this campaign, and you discover it. And so then you go and support that most of the discovery is not happening within the Kickstarter platform itself, which was quite an eye opener for the crowdfunding community as a whole. But getting back to Title III as an avenue for access to capital, I think it's going to be um, a great access for female entrepreneurs starting small and local businesses because of this community aspect. If you think about the return as an investor that you're going to get, and you also get a psychic return with that dollar of supporting a local neighborhood business that you can frequent, that you can walk in and the owner or the people behind the counter know who you are, they welcome you there, you are much more inclined to invest. And ironically, or not ironically, you would expect this, those businesses do better. So when your customers are investors, they tend to frequent more by an exponential amount. They tend to actually purchase more by a major percentage, not like 5 10%, but I think it's 50 to 60% more. And they tend to refer more, again, by a high double-digit amount. So it's really great as a business. Um, to get those loyalty effects. And then you can figure out, like they also look, campaigns that have raised equity investment or debt investment that have coupled that with benefits tend to be more successful. So again, as a small business owner, if you're using the crowd and or your network and their network to raise money, and you can tier just like Kickstarter does for a $500 investment, we're gonna put your name on a brick <clears throat> or we're gonna give you a free copy you know, every week, things like that. Again, that's a reward that gets people coming in to your business, and it increases the success rate. So one of the things that I hear a lot when I talk about startups and entrepreneurship and funding, and I talk about gender gaps or race gaps, is that these gaps exist in traditional forms of funding, in traditional forms of starting businesses, and that one of the potential ways to get around them is to just create new channels, to create new ways of thinking and doing things. Um, and I was recently in Durham, and they were saying, one of the things that we think is really exciting is that we are not New York, we are not Silicon Valley, so we can potentially create a whole different way of doing things here. So I want to know two things. One, do we think that that is the right way to go, and two, what do you think will happen and what is the opportunity there as entrepreneurship and startup sectors move outside of these two locations that have you know, driven so much 
of the startup culture, and I want to start with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so many of you may have heard of Rise of the Rest, which is Revolution's um, program dedicated to showcasing and investing in talented entrepreneurs who are outside of Silicon Valley. Um, one of our core investment mandates is to ensure that the majority of our capital is deployed outside of Silicon Valley. And through the Rise of the Rest program, you know, we've done a 4,000 miles on a bus across a myriad of cities kind of outside or off the beaten path. Um, and what we found is that 32% of our Rise of the Rest companies have female founders. Um, and that's different than 3% of you know, traditional financing paths. You know, I think that the really exciting thing about the world that we live in today is the fact that based on technology, you can start and scale a business anywhere in this country. Um, so that provides a lot of opportunity and growth for these very talented entrepreneurs. And we just need to find the right conduit and channels to reach them. So I, I, um, I think great entrepreneurs are everywhere. I mean, if you look at, at female entrepreneurs, you have Sarah Blakely, who you know obviously had the magnificent Spanx product, <laughs> and <clears throat> you know she was not from a traditional East Coast or West Coast or traditional field. And so, you know, if you're really good and smart and lucky, you can do it anywhere. But there is definitely something happening with these major pools of capital, East Coast and West Coast, and I always say Wall Street East and Wall Street West because they are so alike. It's just a little more informal and casual attire out on the West Coast. But the, the, the direction of capital is controlled by a very small number of people and firms. It just is, the bulk of the money. So when you think about these great women entrepreneurs coming up and you know, maybe they can <clears throat> raise some money locally to get going, but when they really need to scale and become big companies and 100, you know, 50 million, 100 million dollar companies, they hit a wall. And so there's lots happening in that first money in. And one of the things that my company is focusing in now is on the Series A and beyond because so many great entrepreneurs get hit that wall. So it's really, you know, you, you look at success, it, money matters. And so, and not only does the money matter, but it matters for who's deciding where the money goes. And you think about it, like so many women have ideas about products and services and things we need in the world, but they're not funding them, so they're not going to happen. And on the flip side of that, when you look at what is being funded, and I, my latest thing now is virtual reality and these you know, big you know, things that you put on your head, and I, I know there's some educational benefit around that product, but you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are being thrown into that. And, and to me, it's, does that, is that something we really want? Do we really want to not be in our reality? And I kind of think it, that's a product that breaks down by gender. Um, but you know, that's the other issue. It's not only getting capital to these great women entrepreneurs and having the op opportunity to make money back, but it's also having a seat at the table about innovation. What is it we want? What do we want to have money into? And so that's another part of it, because we're building the future. I mean, it's, it's getting faster and faster every, every year. So, you know, we, we need to have our place at that table. We're building a <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> you know, it, it is interesting, though, on that note. Um, right now, there's a female-led company that has taken over several subway stops in New York, um, and their product is called Thinks, T-H-I-N-X. And it is that time of the month undergarment that you wash and wear. And I mean, it's just amazing when I walk through and literally, like, you see it everywhere. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is totally killer. How many men are so completely uncomfortable, you know, by what's going on? But clearly, they found someone who understands that problem. And we are starting to see that. There are a number of um, early stage VCs in New York, like Built by Girls Ventures, that are focusing on early stage funding, you have to have at least one female founder in order to get that capital. And you're starting to hear a lot of dialogue um, at the later stage VCs around making connections and being able to support. But I think it's also important for female entrepreneurs to remember how you pitch and how you present yourselves. There are some realities, um, particularly when you're pitching to men that are unfortunate but practical. 
And so getting your pitch down to the key sound bites, not being afraid to sound like a politician with your stump speech, just repeat and drill those over and over. But it's like a 10 to 12 slide deck, very, very crisp points. Be ambitious, but be practical at the same time. And remember when you're going in, the venture capitalist's job or even the small business loan um, administrator's job is to ask you questions, peel the onion, really get to what's going on in your story and why you need that capital. So answer the questions back and challenge them and be confident in your responses and show them that you've done your homework. And it goes a really long way. Right, and if I could just add on to that too, you know, again, I, I cannot underscore how important that is to bringing women forward. Um, you know, nobody's born knowing the language of business, including those who are in the venture capital or private equity world, right? We all had to come up through that somehow and learn that. So I think mentorship and education is a very important part. Find someone who knows about the lingo and find somebody who can teach you, right? Um, because at the end of the day, what I do and what many of us do in the venture capital industry is really based on pattern recognition. So, you know, you see these guys, you know, they're they're working their networks and they're finding people that can pull them up and they learn the right lingo. They learn how to put the deck together. You know, all of, they learn how to say the right things and women don't need to be afraid of that. You know, my mentors have been mostly male and that's okay. It doesn't have to be necessarily a female who mentors you, right? Um, but I think that to the extent that you can help to you know, help VCs who are, again, mostly male understand and kind of uh, get behind the pattern recognition, I think you'll go a lot further. It's unfortunate, but it's a reality. Yeah, I mean, it, that's it. It's going to take a few more years for us to really get some momentum and change those dynamics. So if you want to get funded now, you just kind of have Play to work game. with the paradigm. I, I agree, and I've, I've seen so many men pitch and women pitch, and <clears throat> What I do think, though, is if, if you're an entrepreneur, you're doing that because you care about it. You're passionate about it. You're, you know, it. So that needs to come across. That is the most important thing. You can have a business model, or you can, and, and, and that's all cool. And, and that's, but that's external things, right, that you can jot down and make the slides and rehearse. But what, what is natural, what is innate and organic, is why you're doing it, how much you care about it, why this is your life. And the, the entrepreneurs that I think are successful on raising money, that is, that it's, it just jumps out at you. And on the other hand, you know, usually the, the pitches I've heard from, from guys are that bravado. You know, oh, this is the hockey stick growth and we're gonna be the next unicorn and we're this and that. And you know what, after a while, after you hear like three or four of those, you just discount it. You just discount it. Like it just, they, they just, it's bravado. And in, in my opinion, when I look at companies now, I, I actually want to see someone who's, who really knows the business and is maybe a little conservative sometimes. And the, the best thing with women entrepreneurs is to say, to ask them the question, okay, if somebody gave you a million dollars, what would you do? If somebody gave you two million dollars, what would you do? Or three million dollars? And you know what happens? Like there's this, I don't know if you've been through this before, but there's that first moment of like, oh, I have no freaking idea. But then there's this like, oh my gosh, I could do this and I could do that. And so if women start to go through that exercise and that process, they actually think, wait, I do need three million dollars because I'm gonna do that. It's just, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I think sometimes the answer is not for, to teach the women to be like the men. The answer is to find your inner strength and believe in it and believe in yourself and believe in your vision and, and try and knock down walls. Can I do I won't let yeah. Amanda get her All thought right. in there. No, go ahead. Um, so we, I obviously also really love the innovation that's happening in the capital space. I think it's amazing, exciting, and just opening more doors. Um, I also am struggling with this conversation a little bit because not everyone is in a position to even raise venture capital money. The majority of women are looking for a loan between fifty and two hundred thousand dollars, right? So um, I think there still needs to be there's still a lot of work to do in terms of like 
we cannot just ignore the fact that the system is broken and just like try to open more doors outside, right? Like at some point we have to address the fact that banks aren't lending to women at the same rates and that there is an un unconscious bias that's playing out. And so I think one of the things, you know, with the council, we spend a lot of time looking at certain sections of other pieces of legislation that have not been implemented yet uh, in terms of let's actually collect information on who's demanding credit. Let's actually understand who's looking for credit so that like we say all the time, you cannot change what is not measured, right? So until we actually know what women are getting in terms of the traditional bank loan space, I mean, I just think that there's a lot of opportunity there. And at the end of the day, most women-owned businesses are not at a stage to get this VC money anyways. And so while I think that this is a very important conversation, I think that we have to have the other conversation right. as well. Well, and again, This is going to be very quick last thought, and then we're going to go yeah. to the audience. So two quick points on that. Um, roughly 34% of businesses that apply for a small business loan are either underfunded or don't get funding. And 19 points of that is they don't even apply. So definitely apply. Yeah. The second is, on a legislation standpoint, Title III has got to get rewritten um, as drafted because guess what? It's too expensive. And to comply with it and to go through the whole regulatory review process, and it is an incredible avenue to raise fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars from your network of women and friends. So again, that's one to advocate because it would massively open up channel and access to capital for women, for people of diversity, all of these alternative problems that need to be solved that aren't alternative, they're real. All right. I want to take audience questions. I want them to be super concise because we have five minutes and we want to fit in as many people as humanly possible. Hi, my name is Shelley Porges. I'm with Entrepreneurs for Hillary. Thanks for all your comments. If you could ask the next president of the United States one thing that you think would be massive in terms of advancing uh, women-owned businesses, what would that be? I'm recusing myself. <laughs> yeah. Why? All right. Anyone have a concise answer? I would answer? reform Title III. I would um, put a loan guarantee program against loans to women entrepreneurs. Anything? No. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Rebecca Carpenter. I'm the founder and CEO of Sprout, uh, Urban Food and Farming. I want to ask you about benefit corporations and the trend towards for-profit businesses with nonprofit missions. I see that more and more women are leading the way on that front, trying to do well and do good at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about um, the trends in investing in those types of businesses and especially women-founded businesses in that space? Very poorly understood. Yeah. Right now, a lot of resistance to investing. Um, but it is a growing trend and in New York in particular, some VCs or actually some funds are starting to be raised around B Corp investing. Yeah, Revolution Foods is uh, one of our investments, which we're very proud of, a female founder, and it is a B Corp as well. Um, you know, it's a fantastic business. They're doing very well by doing good, and um, you know, I, I think that more VCs need to embrace that trend as well. There's also a growing level of just resources and support for those businesses as they're trying to raise capital. So there's a really great program here in DC called the Halcyon Incubator. And it's um, an amazing program for folks that are uh, trying to start those types of businesses. But I do think that's, that's a cultural, that's a shift in the way that uh, investors think about it. And I always struggle on Friday nights when I'm watching Shark Tank and they just don't get it. <laughs> you know, and I think one way to pitch it is to make sure you can put metrics around the good that you're doing so they understand what the trade-off is in the pure profit motive? So I, Halcyon? So also I think one thing that it shows up in the research about women as investors, women as investors want to make a return, but they also want to do good in the world. So for them, investing in companies, it doesn't have to be a B Corp, it doesn't have to be impact investing. They look for companies that they get and, and they want to see in the world. So if you expand the definition of doing good to just companies that we want to see in the world, you would be amazed at the bad stuff that falls away. And so I think what we're, we're going to, especially with uh, millennials and the next generation, is actually the screen of wanting that company in the world is going to be a screen just as important as return, financial return. Okay. Next question. I think we have one right there, and then we have one right in that front row. 
Hi, my name is Polly Vale. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Maryland and an entrepreneur myself. One thing we hear over and over again is how tough it is to find talent, and it seems that talent pipelines are dried up. What are your suggestions for filling up talent pipelines? Who should pay, and where's that going to come from? Somebody needs to start that business. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge that, that all, of, all entrepreneurs, that, at least that I'm aware of, face, right? And, um, you know, back to our Rise of the Rest um, program, the, the wonderful thing about founding a business in an area which is maybe off the beaten path is, you know, as we've seen Baltimore, for example, is the number two or three place, and I probably got that statistic wrong, for young people to move to because it's a new and growing city. So tons of talent um, coming into those spaces. The talent is less expensive. You know, and so I think we need to do a better job of, um, of, again, kind of going to those cities and building those businesses up. Okay. I think a lot of that happens also at the university level. And I will say um, I graduated from college in 2007 and, like, don't ever remember there being any course or anything on entrepreneurship. And I think you're starting to see that shift. So now it's, like, people are normalized to that as a career option and career path. So they're starting to look more for those opportunities. All right. want to get to next question. Right behind you, there we go. Hi, my name is Joy Smith. Uh, I'm the CEO of Fast Trans LLC, which is a commercial trucking company. Um, I'm fairly new. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> I'm, I'm looking to expand. Uh, however, I tend to ask a lot of questions uh, prior to uh, going through with everything. And a lot of times I get that my personal credit score would actually impact the um, getting a small business loan versus my uh, my what I can produce, my profit and loss yeah. statements, et cetera. Uh, and I was just wondering why does that play a major part versus what I can show uh, that I, I can do with, within my business? So I would just say that's another reason why action on Title III yeah. is important. Um, because a lot of these small business loans, it's not only your personal credit score, but you are personally liable uh, for the loan. So your business goes out, they can come after you as an individual. I am not saying that account lack of accountability is good, but Title III would look at your business and your business success as a major, if not the dominant, component. And we actually have to stop there. Sorry for any questions we didn't get to, but thank you guys so much for being a great audience, and thank you guys for being such a great panel.